Well, after yesterday's video, I thought you would all like to see what a clean, pretty kitty looks like. So, welcome to Coffee and Conversation and our few moments of Audie time before we get into the video. As you can see, he has forgiven me completely for making him wet. He's still a little upset because it's been raining. And yeah, I, I know, they know you don't like the rain. They know. And as you know, he doesn't like the rain. So he's feeling a little sorry for himself. Um, it has been raining just bad enough to encourage him to give it a try and go outdoors. But then he sits on the porch railing because it's a little too wet to wander around. When it rains a great deal, when the rain is heavy, he doesn't even want to go out. And when the rain is light, he'll usually go out for a little bit and then back on the porch railing. But this is just a gray and gloomy weekend. Although I have to say, he feels so soft now that he is squeaky clean. He smells good. And he spent last night sleeping on my bathrobe. I said I was going to leave it on the bed for him. And he curled up in my bathrobe and slept there. So I think maybe he has regained his sort of pack smell. Yes, I know. It's important. Um, he smells more like me and, well, my bathrobe. And I think maybe he's made me smell enough like him so that we can live together again. All right, say goodbye. Let them see what a pretty kitty looks like. And I'm going to put you down and we will be back after the intro. Okay, well, I had to restart the video because as soon as I got Audie off my shoulder and began filming, of course, he came back again and again and again. And finally, I just said, okay, I've had enough and I've let him out. And so he is, he's sitting on the porch railing, but what can I say? It's, it's a little easier for me to film when he's on the porch railing than it is when he's curled up on my shoulder demanding that he is the focus of my attention. All right. So I had taken the scarf off. And this, of course, is a wonderfully strong yellow for all our friends in recovery from the big C. And I had this held with a pick. Now, there are a lot of ways to hold a scarf. You can tie it in a knot. Uh, you can use a scarf ring. You can use a, a brooch, a classic brooch. This is not a classic brooch. But as you can see from the color combination, the gold and blue, it is a perfect pin for that scarf. This was made by Lisa of Desert Dragon Works, and I, oh goodness, I've, I've probably had this for three or four years. It's a beautiful piece. I have a pair of them, and it's the lighter blue and the darker blue, and these are the Audi pins. Now, let me just show you this, because this is how I like my pins to close. Magnet and then magnet on the other side. What you do is you remove the rear magnet, place the pin where you want it, and then slip the magnet in the back held. And it's very, very useful if you're inclined to put pins on finer fabrics. Like silk, for example, something you don't want to mar with a bunch of pinholes. And this one, this is fun. And one of the reasons that this and its little friend have magnetic catches on the back is because I, 
I wear them most of the time, and I, I very often wear them together on a silk jacket. And protecting the silk became very important, but they are terrific. This is the Audi pin, and of course, Audi needed to be the star of this video, too, in case you hadn't noticed. So, let's get into the actual topic of the video. I started watching some videos on YouTube about elegant menswear. And there are a number of channels on YouTube about this. And if you like looking at elegant men, and I do, I will admit that, I, I love looking at elegant men. And if you have any interest in the history of fashion, what things used to be like, what the changes have been like over the years. And again, that's something I really enjoy. I would wholeheartedly recommend that you just go on YouTube and dig through these channels. Now, I got hooked on them because of shoe care. Most of my shoes need to be cared for the same way men's shoes need to be cared for. A big part of that is I don't have a lot of weird, you know, patent leather plastic with the rhinestones I used to. Oh, my shoe collection was absolutely legendary for the fact that I could have brought it to Hollywood and they could have used it in the prop department for the hooker scenes. Uh, yeah, trash shoes. Oh, I still have a weakness for trash shoes, but I've stopped buying them. But now when I, I'm dealing with my shoes, the best shoe care tips I get are directed at men, not women. I don't understand this. I have to be honest with you. I don't understand this. People traditionally ascribe that sort of fashion obsessed clothes horse thing to women. I'm not seeing that. I am not seeing that at all in my forays through YouTube. I see boatloads of fashionistas who are advocating. Now, they advocate one of two things. One, designer accessories. It's like, look at these Prada shoes. Look at this Gucci bag. And, yeah, you know, there's a place for that. And I am not denying that I have my fair share of designer bags, yeah, I probably got somebody else's fair share too. But it's either the acquisition of these absurdly pricey items on one hand, that's what you get from these influencers, or on the other hand, it's Kmart shopping. It's like, honestly, it's like the blue light special at Kmart. People are talking about well, gosh. Oh, I am going to mention some of the companies. I was just, the pause there was, do I really want to mention any, any company names? And yeah, why not? Zara. Trash. You want to buy from them? You're buying trash. You are not going to get linen. You are not going to get wool. So just be mindful. Aritzia, same thing. Uh, the frustrating thing about Aritzia is they will sell polyester garbage for three or four times what I can get a good linen shirt for, 100% linen, just by shopping around a little more carefully. So it's that's what the influencer mentality is, like up here or down here, and there's no in-between. And that's what drove me over to the men's channels in the first place, because I have yet to find a good YouTube channel for women, how to care for women's shoes. Maybe it's out there, but I haven't found it. So I started watching them because, of course, when you get into the fashion history, the way men dressed in the 30s and 40s is just, oh, it's to die for. And one of the videos I saw today, in fact, 
was a video from one of the channels explaining why they don't do women's fashions. And they seem to think there's no such thing as classic women's fashions, that women's styles come and go too rapidly. I agree with that, but th there's no baseline. Now, see, the thing is, I could say the same thing about men's fashions. The trends come and go and come and go, but there is a base fashion that has been with us for over a hundred years now. Uh, in the 1920s is when the men's business suit really came into its own. And it has remained largely unchanged since then. Now, yes, it's true that these days the, the pants, the trousers in a men's suit are like just, oh, they're pegged. They are just so tight, it's ridiculous. Uh, in the 70s, they were bell bottoms. Uh, there were times when men wore hats. Now they don't. Well, I think hats are starting to make a little bit of a comeback. But when they do make a comeback, they are more of an affectation, more of a fashion statement than anything else. So we do see the baseline there. But here's the thing. There is absolutely a baseline in women's fashions. And I, here, let me prove my point with Katherine Hepburn. These two pictures, and I keep both of them, they are from my own little inspirations file that I keep in with my wardrobe file. And as you know, I'm just like crazy OC, well, David Beckham is crazy OCD with his wardrobe. I, compared to Beckham, I am only semi-crazy OCD because I'm doing it on the computer and not in real life. So, yeah, I was about to say crazy OCD. No, sorry, Beckham's already taken the crown on that one. But this is from my own files. And I don't know about you, but I look at this and I think to myself, I could see someone wearing that today, and I would not think the woman was underdressed, overdressed, weirdly dressed. No. If I saw someone wearing that outfit today, I would say, well, there is a stylish woman. Doesn't even have to be Katherine Hepburn, who I think could make a potato sack look stylish. But still, I look at that, and I say, that's baseline dressing. And we have to remember, um, I, I couldn't find a date for this particular uh, photo, but I, my best guess is about 90 years old because the pants are quite wide. That was 1930s. And they have cuffs. That's pre-World War II. Because even here in the U.S. Uh, and even in Hollywood where they have the money to burn, it just, it wasn't done. When the war uh, came about in the 19, well, for us, it was 41. For the Brits, it was 39, I think. But so we're going we're gonna to split the difference and say 1940 comes along. And styles had changed because of rationing. You simply couldn't have cuffs anymore. You couldn't have wide trouser legs anymore. Wide trouser legs were useless for the Rosie the Riveter girls. In fact, they were probably dangerous. So if you were working in a factory, you couldn't wear those wide leg trousers. They had to be cut a little closer just for safety's sake and for the fabric rationing. So my best guess is mid to late thirties on this. That's 90 years ago, 90 years ago. And I don't think it looks at all out of place today. If it wasn't Catherine Hepburn, if you threw Anne Hathaway in those clothes, would you be surprised? And for me, the answer is no, of course not. Because we do have sort of a base style. Now, I can do the same thing just by going through pictures to find things like women's dresses or skirts and sweater combinations and come up with tons of looks 
that are just as current today as they were when they first rolled off the, the fashion showroom floors in the 1930s. So, yeah, we do have a base style. We do have classic women's clothing. Uh, the only reason I pull out pictures of Katherine Hepburn, oh, and Marlena Dietrich is in my Inspirations file folder too, along with Amelia Earhart, it's because I don't wear dresses. So I go out of my way to find pictures of women not wearing dresses. So that's just me, my personal taste. If you are a dress wearer, it doesn't take more than a few minutes on the internet to find tons of pictures of gorgeous women wearing styles that were wonderful then, they are wonderful now. Gosh, Jackie Kennedy's Raspberry Blueberry Boucle suit. Everybody knows that one. Um, I know, it's just, it's kind of icky, but still, everybody knows that suit. And we're talking, what, 60 years ago? There is a baseline style for women. Some small things will change. Same thing is true with men's fashions. But most of it, the bones of it, are going to remain the same. So why am I so irritated and annoyed by this? Well, in part, it's because I walk away feeling like the, the sense of who we are as women out there in the wider world is that we're frivolous. We are influenced by every possible trend and style that if we can't get big cabbage roses all over our dresses, we're not happy. That if a designer tells us stripes are in, that's all we have in our closets. And we're just insubstantial creatures of, of a distressed public taste that, that really isn't geared to us as women as much as it is geared to promoting the needs of the fashion industry. And they have to change over and over and over again so that they can sell us a whole bunch of new things. Because if you have a nice wardrobe of classic clothes, you're not going to be tempted by every little flim flam fribbledy deal that shows up in a store, it's like, oh, look, there's an ostrich feather on that. Like, you yeah, know, well, I'm not wearing it. I think what we're looking at is a fashion industry that depends on us, depends on our consumer dollars for its very existence, while at the same time, just creates systems that are inherently denigrating to us. You know, we are just foolish little sheep who will buy whatever is for sale this month. And it's like they want our money, but they have no respect for us. Why don't they want to sell us things that are good quality? Why don't they want to sell us things that we can have for year after year after year? Why not? Why don't they want us to be able to go out and buy a high quality piece from them, knowing, having confidence that we'll have it in our wardrobe 10 years from now, 15 years from now, and that it will not have been cast by the wayside because that very same industry that sold us this stuff in the first place then tells us, no, nope, you wear that, you look dated. I'm starting to feel very manipulated by the fashion industry very manipulated. And it's maddening. So when I start to feel manipulated by the fashion industry, I start sticking with things that, that I understand. So hence shoes, 
going off, taking a look at shoe polishing videos. I was looking for new brands of shoe polish. That's, I know, what a nut. I, I, trust me, I know what you're thinking. Sue, you're freaking crazy. Go back and watch the David Beckham documentary. Yes, okay, I probably will do that. I'm sure David Beckham would fully understand my quest for shoe polish. I really didn't like some of the stuff in my shoe polish box. And I thought, you know, it's been a long time since I've gone shoe polish shopping, decades to tell you the truth. And I bet that other brands, better brands, uh, brands with more quality, brands that will do a better job for me have come out on the market. And here's the thing. Shoe polish, even like the bargain basement stuff you could get at Walmart, that stuff in terms of price is about here, whereas Saphir, which is a really good brand, is only about here. So we're talking about $7, $8 for a tin of cheap shoe polish, like uh, Kiwi. That's, I got, I got a can of Kiwi in there. It's about seven, eight dollars. Saphir, I can get, um, ordinarily, it's somewhere in the range of 20 to 25, but I can find sales on this for much, much less. Sixteen dollars, maybe. Eight dollars, sixteen dollars, when you're in that below twenty dollar range. I would say, yeah, the, dim the difference isn't that great. You know, that it's not like this is a break the bank price point. So I was determined to see what I could come up with. And if in fact I could get some decent shoe polish that's going to do the job I need it to do and so on and so forth. And yeah, crazy obsessive and all that. Now, uh, you are such good therapists. You let me get my crazy out and you don't make fun of me. What more could you ask for in a therapist? Oh, and you're free. Wow. I mean, I feel like I've just pulled the brass ring on the merry-go-round. So that's what I focus on when I feel like, like the world is not in step with where I need to be going. So, yeah, I can't find good sources for classic women's wear. I can't find good sources for wool trousers or things like that. Even when, see, here's the problem. You go to the mid-range places, and I would throw Aritzia in there, and it's trash, it's polyester, and I don't want it. I mean, thank you, but no thank you. And... Then your next step up is the very high-end stores, and they are selling you designer trousers for five, six thousand dollars a pair. And I wouldn't mind paying, well, not five or six thousand dollars. I wouldn't mind paying Aritzia's prices, which tend to be in the two to four hundred dollar range if I was actually getting wool, but I'm not. So, no, they simply cannot charge me that kind of money for polyester. I won't pay it. And that comes along and I think, well, I'm going to have to start making my own. And then I have to look around for the right kind of patterns. And it's just, that is a giant headache. And I probably will get into that eventually because I'm not seeing other options out there. So, Retreating to shoe care is, is a safe spot for me. Shoe care led to these menswear videos. Now, I'm okay with men doing whatever it is they want to do with regard to their clothing and their, their fashion expression. Most of the time, I would have to say, I think these days, especially the men doing those shows on YouTube, are falling into the same trap 
as the clothing manufacturers because they need new content all the time. That's the nature of YouTube. That's the nature of making videos. You gotta make new stuff all the time. And so what they're doing is they're taking classic menswear and they're bastardizing it. They're taking it away from the nice traditional classic. Some people might find that boring. I do not, absolutely not. But they need to throw a little more glitz and a little more glamour in it. And it's like, yes, a man should be wearing socks with bright prints on it under his suit. But really? Really? No. No. And it's because they want to sell you the bright socks. So it's the same thing. What's going on now is everybody is selling everybody else on the newest, the latest, the most gimmicky nonsense out there. And I'm unhappy with it. So this is sort of my complaint rant. Uh, it's also one of the reasons, for example, that I've mentioned this before. One of the channels I follow is the Closet Historian. And she does, uh, she's a, a seamstress uh, and dress designer. And she does retro inspired fashion. So great. Uh, Evelyn Wood, I don't even remember the name of her show. It's Vintage Sewing Something or Other. Uh, she's Australian and she doesn't make videos at this time. She, she is one of our good wishes with yellow recipients because she has breast cancer. So She's coping with that. And that's last I heard. Um, and I have not seen anything from her in at least two or three months. What she did was she would retool vintage retro dresses. Oh, and other things, not just dresses. But she would actually take older clothing and retool the clothing to make it more contemporary, more appealing to a modern eye. So I look at that and think, yeah, you know, when I start thinking about this, my options are dig out the sewing machines and start making it myself. And that's okay for me because I can sew. What about everybody else out there? What about people who can't sew or maybe who can sew up to a point? You know, it's like, well, I can sew up to this point, but making a pair of tailored trousers is out of my skill set range. What about them? It's like, are the only choices available the overpriced polyester stuff you find at places like Aritzia or the overpriced designer stuff you find at places like Neiman Marcus? Where's the middle ground? So, although I do take great pleasure in creating that middle ground for myself in shopping and getting good items at dirt cheap prices because you know I am my mother's daughter I will drive across town to save three cents on a can of peas actually I won't my mother would though but it's what's available for everybody else and I'm just not seeing it out there. There is this giant gap. And it's gap on YouTube, by the way. So if anybody's thinking about starting a YouTube channel, I would recommend that one to you. Classic fashion for women. Go ahead, start making videos. Knock yourself out. There is a hole, well, big hole, in the market that you could plug. But Beyond that, we're still on this, this ridiculous treadmill of buy something because it's stylish. By the time you've worn it a week, it's not stylish anymore. Buy something new because it's stylish, because that's all they're offering us. So yeah, maybe we are frivolous and flighty and feather-brained, but it's because they're not allowing us 
to be anything else. So I guess that's kind of the bottom line. That's, that's where I'm going with this today. Uh, I would suggest that if you do like classic men's fashions, check out some of these YouTube channels. They, they are very, very interesting. But also, if you want to know how to take care of your shoes, don't look for videos about women taking care of their shoes because you're just not going to find them. Stick with the videos designed for men. That's the only place you're going to get this information. And it's, oh, it's frustrating. And who knows, maybe one of you will go out there, grab your camera and fill in the gap because I think we would all benefit from it. All right, that's the sort of rant I have for you today. Audie is, is still on the porch railing, looking out at his wet neighborhood. And I'm pretty sure he'd like me to go let him in so that he can crawl back on my shoulder and tell me how tough his life is. But after yesterday's video, I really did want you to get a chance to see, first of all, what a clean cat looks like, because I do think he's much, much better looking when he's clean, and that he was not traumatized. He is fine with the bath. He's recovered nicely. It, it was not, it wasn't an easy process for him. I, it never is, and he's getting older, so it is a little more difficult, a little tiny bit more difficult to bathe him these days, and I made things harder on myself by doing it um, in the middle of rainy weather. I, I could have done better if I had done this at a nice sunny time when he could be basking in sunlight and that would have gotten him over his irritation a little quicker. All right, we are going to take a look at a slideshow on the way out. I will see you tonight if you join us for just chatting. If not, I will see you next weekend for more coffee and conversation. And in the meantime, have a terrific day. Thank you.